We're going to look at Philemon. All right, I'm going to go preach. Uh, if you know this passage, Paul, he's begging Philemon to take care of uh, and to forgive one of his slaves because this slave was a runaway. But the slave became a saved believer. So now that he became a saved believer, notice what Philemon said at verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, uh, you might have known from a lot of other Bible-believing churches that we should be very spiritual and we shouldn't be fleshly and carnal. And you get that a lot. So, you know, you'll hear about the singing, the shouting, and yeah, it could be carnal, fleshly, sometimes you have to put a limitation over there, so sometimes you'll notice that. Sometimes a person does that to gain attention. And then some people, uh, they'll piously say, when some brother gets zealous and then shouts out, Amen! And then gets overexcited for the Lord, they'll start to say piously that, uh, oh, he's just attracting attention. Some brother might be street preaching, and he might be a little bit too hard or screaming a little loud. But, and then some of the pious people might say, well, he's doing that just to attract attention. And not only that, there are some people, that's not just the fleshly side of that. The, another fleshly side of it is that a lot of Christians, because they think something spiritual is something calm, dedicated, pious, in a Roman Catholic mass, that they lose the joy and excitement in Christianity. So, Brother Tom, they have to go drinking at Catholic Church. Why? Because there's nothing in there that uh, gives them excitement. So they turn to the wrong things for excitement. They turn to contemporary music, which puts louder volume than this, and they put stupid, uh, they put stupid worldly drums, contemporary music, and you have to have queers up here with skinny jeans and you can't tell if it's a guy or a girl swaying like this and then all you guys wanted to see was his bum that's that's what you came to see right now i don't know why people get a thrill out of those kind of services but see that's something that appeases their fleshly appetite a lot of people throw away their christianity because they want to find something fleshly uh to appease their flesh and what I want to get at is, this is not going to be a spiritual sermon. This is going to be a fleshly sermon. Come on, brother. Come on, come on. I'm going to preach a very fleshly preaching today. Because I think there are some people who overlook what God has given some things in the flesh. And I don't want some person to rob you of your joy or the tempter whispering in your ear that that's yeah. fleshly and that's carnal. And then you, it robs you of your joy and you turn to sinful, wrong things in your life yeah. Yeah. to appease your flesh. When there are plenty of things that God has given to you to appease your flesh. Amen. That's right and spiritual. Yeah. You think that food is spiritual? No, you bunch of fat, lazy slugs. You're a bunch of carnal, fleshly Christians. But you know what God says? With prayer and thanksgiving, thank the Lord. You know why? God has given that to you to enjoy. I think that you miss out a lot of fleshly things. Because you blind yourself with something, oh, that's... Uh, you know, I just want to be spiritual. And then you get more frustrated, frustrated, frustrated. And then when you go to church, you're that guy who hides the secret sin mm. in what you're listening and what you're watching. And then you go to church acting all holy with your ties and your shouts. Yeah. You know, I, oh, I need something to satisfy me, to make me happy. Why can't you find that in church? Amen. See that? See that? You bunch of spiritual hypocrites. No, you're not spiritual. You're a hypocrite. Yeah. You're full of the devil. Turning to something to appease your fleshly appetite. That's wrong rather than what's right. And if God has given you so many right things in this world to enjoy, that does appease your flesh, use it. Yeah. All right, go to Leviticus 7. Leviticus 7. All right, so the title of my message is A Fleshly Preaching. 
fleshly preaching. Leviticus chapter 7. I know, it doesn't sound so spiritual. I know, I know. <laughs> Some of you are just uh, so much filled with fake spiritualism yep. that it robs you of your joy in the Lord and one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. That ain't spiritual. If, God, if you're living a spiritual high for Jesus Christ and then trying to say, well, you know, I'm trying to be spiritual for Jesus and trying to do what's pious and right and holy and you're depressed and you're miserable, you don't have any feeling of the Spirit in you. You are not spiritual. That's fake spiritualism. Look at Leviticus chapter 7. We're going to look at verse 15. Now look what God offers them. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. Woo! Bless God! You know, God, he offers you flesh to enjoy. Isn't that what that passage shows right here? And he says, don't left over. Enjoy every bit of it. You know what your problem is, Christians, is that when God has given you things that appeases your senses of your flesh and God says, why don't you enjoy every ounce of it, you're not enjoying every ounce of it. Instead, what you do to enjoy every ounce of it is sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. But when God gives you flesh, to enjoy. Why don't you take opportunity to enjoy every ounce of it? You know what I'm going to do at this summer camp? I'm going to find anything that's fleshly and then try to enjoy every bit and ounce of it. I'm going to try to find any amen out there and I'm going to amen it out. I'm going to find every hallelujah out there and I'm going to hallelujah it. I'm going to find any chair out there and I'm going to throw it and I'm going to find any sign out there and street preach my heart out. I'm going to find any music out there and shout for the Lord and I'm going to find any thrill and joy and excitement out there and I'm just going to run and have a good time. Amen. Now you can sit down and pretend you're spiritual and be bored and depressed. And then when summer camp is over, when you go back to your secret sins, back to your fleshly wrong things. Come on, brother. Yeah. Come on. You're not spiritual. Remember that. That ain't the will of God. That ain't the will of God. There are some people, I remember Pastor Stevenson mentioned an example where there was a person who was soul winning. He mentioned this in public preaching, so I can say this too. He mentioned there was a soul winner and going soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, but then neglected his own family. And that's a fleshly thing that the Lord blessed. Now, isn't it one man, one wife, they two shall be one flesh? And that's a benefit and a blessing of the Lord? And why don't you enjoy every moment of it and stop using spiritual excuses that, oh, I need to do it because souls need to get saved. Don't give me the excuse, the ministry, the ministry, and the Bible reading, Bible reading, prayer, 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 and I got to be devotional. I mean, why can't you enjoy the fleshly things that the Lord has given to you? Come on, brother. That's good What's your problem, man? What's your problem? I'm going to eat every ounce of it. I'm going to eat every enjoyment. You know why? Because look at verse 17. The Lord don't give it to you every day. That's when you can... That's your opportunity to be spiritual. When the Lord takes away the fleshly, the, uh, the things that appeases your flesh, the excitement, the thrill, uh, socializing with other people, and etc. Don't worry, you'll get your lonely time with the Lord, trust me. Don't worry, you'll get your hardships, trust me. The Lord will give it to you. Why do you have to create a false one for yourself? You know, if you're crying in a corner and you say, oh God, I serve you faithfully and I don't know why all, all these bad things happened to me, that's your fault. Yeah. You created that atmosphere, not God. Don't worry, your spiritual time will come. Your trial and tribulation will come. You don't have to prove it right now. Because the Lord says right here at verse 17, but the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day See, there's a limitation, a time limit there. Shall be burnt with fire. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted. 
neither shall it be imputed unto him that offereth it. It shall be an abomination, and the soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity. Amen. Yeah, then the guy who's rolling around the room and then screaming hallelujah and stuff like that is attracting attention to himself when the Lord has not given him that opportunity to do so. The Lord didn't time it right. Sometimes the Lord, it's not the right timing to go visitation yet. Street preaching yet. It's not the Lord's timing yet to start uh, being in confrontation with somebody. Be non-compromising and yell scripture right at them. That's a time when the Lord says patience. And guess what? When he says patience, trust me, that's plenty. He's going to do it for a long time. Yeah. And love, charity, peace, and seriousness, holiness, and all that kind of stuff. He'll give it to you. And it can last for a long time. So guess what? Uh, how long did they enjoy that flesh? Two days. Two days. <laughs> Bless God. If God gave me some flesh to eat, then I'm going to enjoy every bit of that flesh because it's a limited time. You know what I got left? I got one more night left in this summer camp. And bless God, I am going to shout. And I'm going to scream. I'm going to run the aisle, brother. And I'm going to shout amen. And I'm going to run. And I'm going to thank the Lord. And I will cry on the altar. I got one more night. One more night to shout. One more night to scream. And one more night to go Mickey Mouse voice. One more night. I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to get this every night. One more night. One more night. I might as well run around the room right now. Throw a chair. Toss a hand or something. You got one more night for summer camp. One more night to cry with your brother and sister in Christ. One more night to just fellowship with them. One more night so that your flesh can get excited, thrilled, have peace and joy. One more night. I only got one more night. I'm going to spend every last ounce of my energy Amen. to eat that last, that last bit of food on the plate. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to chew on it. I'm going to digest it and enjoy it. Yes. Burger King! That is as good, amen. And maybe God might try drop a second plate. No, okay. One more night! Yeah! yeah. Oh, Ezekiel 36. This is good stuff. Ezekiel 36. You know what your problem is? Especially you young people. This is summer camp. I'm preaching at young people too. You know, you're, you're seeking the appetites of your flesh in the wrong things when God has given you so many things already in your household. God has given you so many things, but you're not searching for it. That's your problem. If I were you, I'd find anything that would make me happy to enjoy. If it's a sports, it's a family member, someone that I love. Some, some hobby that I can enjoy. I mean, you, you live in America for crying out loud. Yes. Yeah. And you kids have to seek the sensation of your flesh with just a video game. You need it that badly. Yeah. What happens if the video game goes into the lake of fire? Oh, I lost my fun for eternity. Oh, yeah, I'm going to die. Come on. See, that, that's, that's something that's wrong and sick. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with sports. There's nothing wrong with sometimes, you know, playing video games and then also computer games and then some, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. But the thing is, is that the problem with some of you people is that you seek into the wrong things and then you watch stuff that you shouldn't be watching, hearing stuff that you shouldn't be hearing. Yep. And then you hang around with the wrong crowd that you shouldn't be hanging around when you got a crowd right here and you got something to see right here and you got something to listen to right here. One, the one, the world, man. What's the matter with you fleshly, carnal Christians? Come on, come on, preach. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. 
let me tell you something. Didn't you know? I get the, I understand that, oh, this is too fleshly, too carnal. I wonder if it's too spiritual. Some people say, fill us with the filling power of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes these people, they can be a little carnal, right? Like these Pentecostal churches, fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. And they repeat a verse like seven times, the word seven times, and it appeases their sensations of their flesh. And they just cry randomly and speak in tongues randomly and go la, la, like that randomly. And then that's obviously not the filling power of the Spirit. That is fleshly carnal. You might say, why is that? Simple. It contradicts Scripture. It's that simple. But if in the Bible it talks about they sang, they shout, they clap their hands and dance and leap, then what's wrong with doing that? Nothing wrong with doing that. Can that be the filling? Didn't you know that could also be the filling power of the Spirit when they leaped, when they jumped, when they shouted? When they fellowship, when you thought those things were carnal, that's actually spiritual? No, I don't think something spiritual can appease the sensations of my flesh. Look at Ezekiel 36. Look at verse 26. Uh, I like verse 25 better. All right, That way we can make sure it's clean here. Notice the person is doing this in a clean way. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. And he shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. Now notice when God cleans up all the gunk in your life and puts a new right spirit in you, what happens? And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of what? Flesh. Well, God is against the wrong type of flesh right there. How many of you are just like this passage where you had a stony heart when you came before this summer camp and the devil got to you and you got discouraged and you felt alone and then you felt like sinning and you're just stubborn and arrogant. But then God just started to put his spirit upon the summer camp. And then that stony heart just went. And then God turned that the fleshly sensations where it was so stirred up by the Holy Spirit that God put a new heart of flesh right there. Amen. See, something spiritual can affect your flesh. Amen. Don't tell me it don't. Sure it does. You never, you never had a time in your life when God was real to you during a trial and situation when you were crying and then when you heard a sermon it convicted you and gave you encouragement. Isn't that a fleshly sensation? Isn't love, joy, peace, fleshly sensations? But God says they are the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, that's right. Something spiritual can affect your fleshly sensation. You know what you, some of you Christians need to do when you got a sin problem, when you're struggling with the same thing and depression and loneliness, and I don't know what fleshly thing you're struggling with, but what you need to do is you need to take that nail and like what Jesus did, you know, you need to nail that flesh through the cross, bam! And when it says, oh, I want to sin and mess up, bam! And then, well, I want to be depressed and sad, bam! And I don't want to read my Bible and pray, bam! Yeah. And when you nail that stony heart of flesh, you need to replace it with something spiritual. Amen. And you might go, oh, I don't like Bible reading and prayer. But man, when you keep nailing that, when you keep nailing the lust and the sins of the flesh and you replace it with something spiritual, the flesh will cry and whine at the beginning. But then when you keep reading that scripture, you go, oh, I found an interesting verse. Ooh, this is really good. And then you get a little fleshly and you start to highlight all over your Bible and then write notes all over. And then some of you who are so carnal, you start to dispensationalize the pages with lines right here. And then you draw diagrams on it, pretending you're so smart. And then you go, hey, pastor, I found a new revelation right here. And then I go, you're kind of a little fleshly, brother, but I'll take that. Amen. Amen. Pretty soon, your fleshly desire changes when you replace it with something spiritual. Amen. Man, thank God, how many of you were used to crap, we were used to rap, and we're used to pop, and rap, and rock, and heavy metal, and then your fleshly desire changed with Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Wow. 
Wow, you bunch of fleshly Christians, you. Wow. Wow, what happened to your joy with rock? What happened to heavy metal? What's the matter with some of you, man? Your fleshly desire. That fellowship you had with the worldly people, you know, you thought they were cool, they were rad. They had the latest hairstyle, which is green and purple and a rainbow on their hair. And you said, that was cool stuff. And then when you went to a Bible-believing church, you know, your flesh said, oh, look at that. They look like a bunch of Mormons. And, you know, I don't like what Pastor Kim said about dress codes. And I just want to act like a little fairy, you know, with my skinny jeans on and with the long hair, you know, like that. <laughs> and then when you and then with those worldly friends that you thought you had a good time you start to get sick in your stomach man yeah, and they yeah, took the Lord's right. name in vain because you start to read more of the Bible you start to hang around with the right crowd and you're like man the people in this summer camp is different from my worldly friends right there and then you're like wow and then you're like wow this is a fun time right over here at summer camp when you go back to the world saying okay I'm going to go back to my worldly friends and you go this ain't the same thing and you start to get sick in your stomach and you feel guilty and you feel like garbage because they they talk about garbage and the world and the flesh what happened your fleshly desire changed because you kept nailing that sucker that flesh like a hammer and you replaced it with something spiritual it's called page 67 Now, some of you go back to your Bible reading. All right? Oh, it's boring. It's hard. And then you need to nail that sucker. And then just nail it and nail it. And pretty soon you'll go, wow, the Bible's actually interesting. Amen. After all. Amen. The Bible's not hard to read after all. It's actually very simple. Amen. I thought prayer was a work, you know. But then when I pray to the Lord and I draw closer to Him, oh, man, I can pour out my emotions, my feelings to Him. You know what's unbelievable? You pay thousands of dollars to psychiatrists yeah. to your problems and you can't come before the Lord in prayer. Free treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, you're something else, yes. man. Yeah. You're something else, man. Yeah. Well, I got a fleshly, uh, I got a fleshly thing that I just want to pour out my emotions and let somebody hear me. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What's yeah. the matter with you? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Amen. Change your fleshly desire with something spiritual. That's what you need to do. You know why some of you young people don't feel something real in your life and you find no joy, no excitement in your life? Because you refuse to nail that sucker. Come on, right. You need to nail the flesh first. Yes. You ever saw a little kid, you know, uh, enjoying the little toys? And they love that. But their desires change as they grow older. And then when their desires change, it's not an easy feeling. They're like, oh, I wanna keep the toy a little bit, a little longer. But then they get, then their desire changes a little more when they realize, when they realize that this is just foolish things and immature things. Yeah. And then I find something more real now. You know, as you get older and older, you find something more real. You find uh, more, I guess, adult things to do. And then you enjoy those things. How many, how many of you grown adults want to go back to your toys again and then play with the little kids in our church and go like this, you know? I don't see anyone doing that. You know why? You're, you know what the point is? The point is you change your fleshly desire even though you didn't want to, but now that when you change it to a new desire, you have no interest in the old fleshly desire. What's your problem, man? Change it. Change it. What your problem is, your problem is, no, I'm born this way. I was born this way. And I stay this way. That's your problem, man. You got a mental condition, and you better nail that sucker. Nail it down, man. Nail that flesh. Nail the sin. Nail the depression. Nail the smoking. Nail the marijuana. Nail the gambling. Nail the alcohol. Nail the anger. Nail the violence. And start replacing it with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Yeah. Prayer, soul winning, street preaching. Amen. Hang around with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. 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 Love you, brother. Seek everything that the Lord gives to you. 
and change that desire. Go to Mark. Mark, we heard this preaching, right? Go to Mark. I think it's 14. Mark 14. We're going to look at Mark 14. Now here's a woman. We heard this preaching before. We heard, now we see this woman where the pious, dignified, spiritual disciples... And you can imagine Peter, James, and John saying, I'm the right hand of Jesus. All looking at Mary and saying, wow, look at her, trying to attract attention to, by everybody. Like, look at me, you know. I bought a very expensive perfume, and I'm putting it at Jesus' feet. And some of these disciples are like going, she should have done a secret closet, private prayer. She should have given it to the poor. Oh, yeah, maybe she... You know, why couldn't she do it privately? Why couldn't she give it to Jesus? Oh, maybe she was being carnal. Maybe she wanted to attract attention. But you know what Jesus said at verse 6? Jesus said, let her alone! Yeah! Yeah! Some, of you, uh, some of you people know what I'm talking about. Now, of course, if they're out of bounds, you got to control them. The zeal can go out of bounds to a point where they are fleshly carnal and not right with the Lord. But have you seen some of these people? It's not like they're deliberately doing it. It's, and maybe they're not doing it the right way like you are doing it. Come on, come on. But when they first get saved, yeah. and, then God, and they know what God delivered them from, yeah. yes. and all of a sudden they get just a passion and fire, yeah. and they burden some of your people, but you understand where they came out from, and they're like, Pastor, Pastor, let's go soul winning today. And you're like, oh, no, not, not, uh, not yet, not yet. We need to wait a little longer. Oh, I want to go soul winning, Pastor. You're, and then, you know, that's the idiot at the front row going, Amen, Pastor. And the people are going, Bless God. And then, you know, the people are thinking, Man, that guy's trying to attract attention. You know what Jesus said? Let her alone. You ever, you ever seen these zealous Christians and then you're like, ah, leave them alone, leave them alone, leave them alone a little bit. You know why? Because there's something in their heart that you don't want to hurt. And they've got a zeal and a passion for the Lord. And yeah, maybe they're a little fleshly here and there, but man, they've got something like Mary had. I love Jesus! Yeah. Yeah. And that's, why they're, and that's why they're the idiot who holds a sign in street preaching with repent bright t-shirt, neon t-shirt on, and saying, don't burn in hell. Jesus Woo! saved. Yeah, maybe he's a little fleshly, a little carnal, but Woo! leave him alone. Yeah, yeah maybe, the, maybe the guy who tossed a hymn book knocked over somebody by accident, but you know what? Leave him alone. <laughs> yeah, maybe the person, you know, went on the altar too early and cried a little loud. Leave that person alone. Man, maybe Robert is wearing out his voice and going Mickey Mouse. Leave him alone. Yeah, maybe Nathan is going to uh, faint on the ground and throw up. Leave him alone. Yeah, maybe Pastor Gorski will go in testimony time. I thank God for Pastor Kim and how much he's done for me. And cry. Hey, leave him alone. Let him cry. Yeah, Pastor Stevenson might cry all the time when a bunch of Koreans get up and sing. And then he's going, oh, 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 I can't sing. Oh, oh, leave him alone. Bless God. Keep crying. Keep shouting. Go around the altar. Take a laugh for Jesus. Amen. Wake the box. That's good. Yeah, leave them alone. They just love Jesus a little too much. Maybe a little bit more than you. Amen. They'll learn. They'll learn a little bit. They'll learn. Leave them alone. We're going to, we're going to go to 1 Timothy 3. First Timothy chapter 3. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. You know why? <laughs> this is something, man. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if there's one thing I hate the most in the world, more than the devil, is my flesh. Because I hate this thing that lets the Lord down all the time. But 
you know what's so amazing? Is that the thing that I hate the most is the one that Jesus gladly accepted to bring salvation to all of mankind. 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God, help me. I'm just catching my breath a bit. You know, man, I hate my flesh. And you might hate your flesh. You might wish that, some of you might be wishing that, man, if only I could preach a little better, right? Why am I overzealous and then pastor keeps correcting my sermon outline and the way that I behave toward people? Because the flesh, it falls in its way. You have a good heart. Uh, do you understand what I mean? You have a good heart, passionate heart for the Lord Jesus Christ, but this flesh is so wicked and weak. Amen, Thank you, brother. brother. And it just keeps messing up. What makes it worse, what makes it worse is that you had a fire and a zeal and you, you come to church and then, you know, you're a little bit fleshly so the pastor tries to limit you and you kind of get a little discouraged. But combine that with your personal sins that you struggled with as well, then you feel even more guilty and then you feel like that, you know, it doesn't matter how much effort I pull in for the church, I'll never be good enough for the Lord. That's right. And some of them don't come back to church anymore. Every time they come to church Sunday, they just feel guilty rather than motivated to change their life for Jesus Christ because they just feel so defeated. They feel like crud. They feel like garbage. And they hate their flesh. How many people have I seen fall away, utterly discouraged, defeated, and they hate themselves? And they know that they're struggling with perhaps a drinking problem and they got children and the church looking up to them. And then some of you members have let the pastor down before and that just makes you feel awful and bad. And you just hate your flesh and sometimes, I don't know if you thought about this, I thought about this. Haven't some of you preachers felt the same or maybe it's just me that, wow, why do I just keep messing up as a pastor? I'm giving my life out for Jesus. I'm trying my best for Jesus Christ. I've got other pastors correcting me and I got the pressure of the members on my shoulder. They don't appreciate what I do. And the Lord's putting me to trial and affliction. I mean, I wish I could do better. I wish I could do what's right. And well, Lord, why am I doing wrong? Why am I still stuck with 10 people in church? Come on, brother. Come on. Yeah. And you hate yourself because you're not the great Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. You're not like Dr. David Peacock. And you're not like some of these great preachers who might have bigger members and wider influence. And all you have is just a small crowd. And you wish, man, if only I had his mind. If only I had uh, his experience and his wisdom. And I hate myself. And I, I wish I could do better. Let me tell you something, my friend. You might hate your flesh, but Jesus Christ fully understands the weaknesses of the flesh, and He says, I'm going to use that. Amen. I'm going to use that Amen. to bring salvation to all mankind. Amen. And that's why you got to keep looking unto Jesus. Amen. Go look at Jesus, not at Ruckman, not at other preachers. Look at Jesus, Amen. what He did in the flesh. Yes. He took it. He embraced it. He was born with it. And he was not, uh, the Bible says that there was no beauty we should desire of him. He was born in a smelly stable. He had no place, no roof over his head. He went through the worst lowly states that any flesh could go through. He went through torture and death. Torture and death, man. And he says, I'm going to use that for my glory. I'm going to use that dead piece of meat nailed on the cross for my glory to nail sin on the cross and save you and you and you and you and you. Now, if God can use a piece of weak flesh for his glory, can he use you for his glory? Amen. Who do you think you are, a special exception more than Jesus? Christ knows the feeling of our infirmities. Wow. Good preaching. 
And man, when you feel like crud and you feel like a failure and you feel like you messed up and you haven't done anything right, remember Jesus Christ. And he said, I use that for my glory. Don't tell me I can't use you. You might be the most incompetent preacher, the most incompetent Christian, the most incompetent soul winner, the most incompetent person that we should look up to. But guess right? Guess what? There's one person that's competent, and that's Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ can use a piece of dead flesh for his glory, he can certainly use your flesh. Amen. Man, you bet. Man, I don't understand. Why can't you be happy? Why can't you cry? Why can't you shout that Jesus Christ will use a rotten, dead piece of meat like you that failed him over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and God will use your dead piece of meat over and over and over and over and over and over again. His grace is greater than all your sin. Mercy is made new every morning. He's got enough in his piggy bank to outnumber your weaknesses of your flesh. Now you better pick up that dead piece of meat of yours and use it for God. Amen. Let's use what we can for Jesus Christ. There's not so much time. There's not much time where we can use our flesh for the Lord. Why? You know, uh, why not? You know what I can use my flesh for the Lord? You know what gets my flesh going? Is that when I just see the excitement. My flesh seeks after it. excitement, entertainment, and something that thrills my soul. And why do I turn into the wicked things of this world for that one? Why can't I turn to things that thrills my soul? You know what gets my flesh pumping? You know what gets my flesh shouting? You know what gets my flesh happy and joyous? And then I scream like an idiot? Because when I hear stuff like, Jesus died for me. And I'm not going to burn in hell. He provides all my needs. He gave me a mansion over the hilltop. And Satan's going to burn in hell forever. And this flesh will turn into dust. And he will rapture it. And that I don't have to suffer. And that in heaven, all the sufferings will be gone. All things work together for good. Don't you think my flesh will shout? Nothing to shout about. Nothing to shout about. None that makes your flesh excited. I mean, Jesus only died on the cross. I mean, you're only saved from hell forever. Nothing to shout about, all right? Nothing that gets your flesh excited. So be quiet. Be still, you know. Nothing to be excited about. Nothing to be happy. No, shut. Shut. Don't shout. Don't shout. Nothing gets your flesh excited. I mean, I mean, Jesus only died for you. He promised you eternal security. He said that you will know. You will know. You will know you go to heaven after you die. So don't shout, brother. No, no, calm down. Sit down. Brother, sit down. Sit down. Nothing to shout about. You only got a mansion in heaven. Why don't I seek after those things for my flesh? I would like to close you close with something important. First Corinthians three. First Corinthians chapter 3. And then I want you to go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5. This hit me. This hit me. I have the right just like the Apostle Paul at Romans 7, that the thing perhaps that I hate the most more than any other besides the devil is my own flesh. But that's when it comes to sin. Ephesians 5. Look at this. Look at verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but... <laughs> nourisheth and cherisheth it. Is that wrong? No, look at this. Even as the Lord, the church. 
Now we take, uh, follow along with me, okay? I'm gonna go a little bit RC Sproul and Calvinist deep with you, all right? Okay, so follow along with me. I'll try to make it as simple as I can. Maybe I'll rightly divide and go one by one, all right? What we tend to do with this passage is that we explain how God's relationship with the church is really true with the example of no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourisheth it, right? So in other words, if I'm going to teach you Ephesians 5, 29, I want to try to make the point on how much the Lord cherishes and nourishes the church. But how I'm going to do that is use the example that, hey, with your flesh, I mean, you nourish, you cherish it, right? I mean, that's common sense. We all do that. We want to make ourselves look good. We want to make sure that uh, if our flesh is hungry, that we feed it. That's why some of us fall into sin, right? Because we want to appease the flesh. As much of a truth in that one, that's how much the Lord cherishes the church. That's how we would tend to teach. But what if it was... The point is these two statements are true, though. The, two, the statement about people nourishing, cherishing their flesh, as well as the Lord cherishing the church. That, these two statements are true. So what if we did it backwards then? Then it should work backwards. What if I were to say that how much you should nourish and cherish and care for your flesh is as much as how much Jesus loved you? That's good, brother. That's good. And if you go look at that passage, right? Yeah. How much he cared for you believers, how much he gave his life for the church. Is as, and he's trying to prove this point with what? With how much you cherish and nourish your flesh. So then why don't you do that then? Isn't this statement true? That you nourish and cherish your flesh as much as Jesus loved the church? Shouldn't that be true? Should I hate the flesh when it lets God down? Of course, in the context, in the context of sin, I should hate my flesh. But when I use this flesh for the service of the Lord, yes. I should take every good care of it and nourish it. You might say, why? 1 Corinthians 3. Did you forget that verse? Verse 16. You're there, right? 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. That's your body, isn't it? Isn't, didn't God call this holy? That's crazy. In the eyes of following the context of sin and letting God down, we know this is wretched, as Paul said, nothing good in my flesh. But in the context of this is God's residence, he sees as something holy. You know why I should take very good care of myself? Because this is God's home. And I want to make God's home as great as can be. Won't the Spirit be grieved when I feel grief? Shouldn't I care for this temple? Because this is God's home. If you don't love enough to stay in this home right here, which none of us are, there's one person who loved enough to stay in this home right here. <sighs> Till the day you die, and even if you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, yeah. loved you enough to stay right here. Yeah. Loved your flesh enough to use it again. And to use it again. And again, and again, and again. You know, the problem with a lot of you is that uh, our mind is so much focused on, quote-unquote, spiritual things. You know, the church and other people. Which is true, it should be Jesus, others, and you, right? That's what joy is, right? But joy is not Joe. You have to include you. And there's no one else you can blame. Don't blame God. Don't blame other people when you keep doing Joe, Joe, and Joe, and Joe, and Joe. Start doing joy. And that fulfills your own happiness. 
Are you taking good care of this flesh? I'll tell you what doesn't take good care of this flesh. When you go back to sin again, when you skip your Bible reading and prayer, when you start to use spiritual excuses to wear out this body, and then you pretend you're suffering persecution for Jesus Christ when it's yourself. That's not good, taking good care of your flesh. You know, if, uh, there's one question in my mind. If you can't take good care of your flesh because you feel like that you shouldn't be happy, then why not do it for the sake of making Jesus happy? This is his home. And why don't you take good care of it this time? Your temple does no good for God if it's wearing out and if it's dying and if it's depressed and sad and you serve Jesus all tired, weary, depressed and sad and broken. You do no lick of good for God. But when you take good care of this flesh, watch your diet, watch your health, watch your sleep. And, you know, uh, yes, it's others. And yes, I got to spend time for Jesus Christ. But when's the last time I spent for myself? And if you were to take, prioritize on taking good care of yourself, wouldn't you have the strength to take care of others and then get, lay down your body as a sacrifice for Jesus Christ? How did you come to this summer camp to glorify God? Because some of you have younger bodies, stronger health, or you took good care of your health. Some of you want to stay at summer camp so badly that you took special care of your health after you fainted on the ground. Remember that? A lot of times when we serve God, we get too hard on ourselves. And there's one thing that I learned is that that was my problem. And what I need to do is, you know, if there's one thing that I need to do is I got to say, not that I love, understand this, is that, you know, when I look at my flesh in the mirror, I'm going to go, man, one day you're going to turn to dust. You're not going to let me down anymore. And then Jesus is going to rapture you. But, but, despite of the sin and the lust that you mess up in, I do care for you. And I'm going to take good care of you when I look at myself at the mirror. I'm going to say, I'm going to make sure that you stay away from sin. I'm going to make sure that you're happy doing that. I'm going to make sure that you find joy in living for Jesus Christ. And anything that God gives me to enjoy, I'm going to take every opportunity to enjoy it. I'm going to look at myself at the mirror and say, you know what? I care about you enough that much, and I'm going to do it. But if you can't do that to yourself, then remember this. Jesus Christ says that to you, that I care about you. And I care. I mean, didn't the Bible say that uh, about health at the book of 2 John? Didn't the Bible say that don't defile and corrupt the temple of God? God sure cares about it. And Jesus Christ says, you may not care about yourself, you know what the blessing is to me is that I may not care about myself too much, but Jesus Christ will say, it's okay, Eugene, huh? I care about you. I care about you. Maybe that will encourage me a bit to take a bit more, better care of myself. 